Good morning. Welcome to Oak Grove on this beautiful Palm Sunday. It's so nice to see the sun shining, and even if it's not as warm as we'd like it to be, I'm ready to see daffodils blooming. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> if you would stand with me and um, take your bulletin, the call to worship is in the bulletin this morning. So if you would stand and join me. Come, people of God, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day Jesus enters Jerusalem. The Lord of the gates of righteousness, so that we can enter and give thanks to the Lord. The gates are open. Come in, give thanks, for God is good. Join me in prayer. God of grace, you have given us minds to know you, hearts to love you, and voices to sing your praise. Fill us with your spirit that we may celebrate your glory and truly worship you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Matt will come and lead us in our first hymn, number 238. So you actually get to sit for this song because we like to be able to see the kids as they do their palm, palm waving. So you may be seated and sing with me number 238.
Okay, you may stand and turn to number 237, right across the page. Go ahead and stand. Besides me, have trouble singing the first hymn because you were so busy watching the children. <laughs> that was delightful. Thank you, kids. Um, you, if you check your bulletin, you will see that we're loaded up with announcements. Um, this is a special week. We've got um, a lot going on. If we have anybody who has announcements, um, now is the time to come up and share. Do you have some? The Property Commission has made a work day for this Saturday. That would be March 31st at 9 o'clock a.m. This will be primarily for the exterior uh, grounds, the exterior of the building, uh, trying to get in preparation for our celebration the 14th and 15th of April. 
Uh, so we'll enjoy a lot of people coming out. We'll try and find something for anybody, young or old. Um, and if the weather does not cooperate this Saturday, then we'll try next Saturday, which would be April the 7th at 9. Thank you. Bicentennial Committee has been meeting for the last two years, or a couple years, I should say. I guess it's not exactly two, to try to plan this year of celebration together. And many of you have also been involved in a variety of ways in, in uh, helping to plan and put that together. As a committee, we're pretty excited about what all we have planned and the, the things that are coming. And we'd really encourage you to join in as, as much as you're able to the activities of this celebration. Uh, as we've said before, it happens over kind of three weekends, although you've seen many things going on already and you've been a part of those. So I uh, really want to encourage you. In your boxes this morning, there's a, a brochure that will be based on our first weekend together, and I think you're seeing it on the PowerPoint. Uh, Jason Kaufman from uh, uh, Director of Archives and Records for Mennonite Church USA will be our guest speaker for the weekend, and it will happen in, in three different parts, the first of which is uh, Saturday evening, and it'll be a time of him sharing together, as well as a time of presenting a timeline that will be surrounding the church that will stay up for the year, uh, a chance to look at activities from our beginning to present day that have shaped uh, us as people. And then also, uh, we'll see a book come out that Levi Miller has been busy putting together, uh, Sketches of God's Faithfulness, and the foyer will be full of uh, displays that will talk about the activities that, that Oak Grove has been involved in over these years, and Jenna is working with putting that together for us. Uh, the second weekend then, part two, uh, our second meeting, part two, will be in the morning on uh, Sunday morning during the Sunday school hour. Jason, again, will be sharing with us, and uh, Paul Miller will be joining with him in that to sort of do a back and forth about uh, stories that uh, have helped to shape us. The third session, then, will be during our worship time, part three, and uh, you can see that it will be sort of a tr traditional uh, worship hour, although uh, Jason will be uh, sharing uh, on another topic of Oak Grove's particular contribution to God's work both in the past and, and in the present. Uh, again, we're hoping that Levi might present, uh, talk about the book again, knowing that probably uh, we'll have a little bit different, different audience than we have on uh, Saturday evening. So we are looking forward to this time together. We invite you to join in, come and be a part of that weekend as we begin this year of celebration together. I'll direct your attention to the bulletin um, on the opposite side of our re weekly prayer bulletin, which lists our prayer requests. Um, there are also opportunities that are coming up. Add to that opportunity for Easter Sunday, um, Corbin Schrock, is, our own Corbin Schrock, is going to be sharing um, his medical mission testimony with us next week during the services. Um, also, just a reminder that um, on Good Friday, we'll be having our Tenebrae service at 7 o'clock here. Join me in prayer. Jesus, Messiah, the crowds around you can be thrilling or frightening. One moment they are clay in your hands, ready to be shaped. The next they are squeezing you like putty in a clenched fist demanding that you conform. Is that what we do? When we count the cost of your words for us, it hurts. We get it. Why the masses turned and your disciples faded away. Do you? The time is ripe for change, then and now. Why can't you lead the change in a way we understand? How is it that you define success so differently? It scares us to question you. It's worse if we don't. Forgive us for holding in questions so long that we can't bear the answers. Forgive us for fearing the crowds and the consequences. 
Open our eyes and hearts to receive your teaching. Show us again this new way of living. Help us to love like you. or your devices and turn to John chapter 12 verses 12 through 16 I'll be reading in the message Come on. the next day the huge crowd that had arrived for the feast heard that Jesus was entering Jerusalem they broke off palm branches and went out to meet him and they cheered Hosanna Blessed is he who comes in God's name. Yes, the King of Israel. Jesus got a young donkey and rode it, just as the scripture has it. No fear, daughter Zion. See how your king comes, riding a donkey's colt. The disciples didn't notice the fulfillment of many scriptures at that time. But after Jesus was glorified, they remembered what was written about him, matched what was done to him. Turn in your church hymnals, uh, sorry, your hymnals to page 43.
morning. It's uh, this Palm Sunday morning as uh, we celebrate one of my favorite uh, Sundays of the year. And uh, what isn't there to like about it? A parade, uh, lots of palm branches uh, going all over the place. And uh, the crowds of people singing hallelujahs. Uh, the great worship celebration, the connections of, uh, in this text with uh, the Old Testament, uh, out of the Psalms, Psalm, Psalm uh, 118, uh, used by the people in their praises of worship coming uh, to Jerusalem. And uh, here is John's account of it in uh, John chapter 12. And there are parallels to this in each of the Gospels. It's one of those uh, stories that uh, uh, every gospel writer included, which is interesting. Uh, John um, does an interesting thing, though, with it. Uh, he actually uh, divides it up a little bit. He has the parade here in chapter 12, but earlier uh, he had given reference to Jesus cleansing the temple. In the uh, other gospels, in Matthew and Mark and Luke, the cleansing of the temple goes along with this march, uh, this parade on this Palm Sunday. So um, whether Jesus cleansed the temple a couple of times or, or whatever, it's, it's not part of John's account here as he records uh, his story and his testimony. And that may be a significant uh, signal to us that uh, John is using this account in a special way. Um, I... Well, we've, we always focus on Palm Sunday uh, and, and this text on Palm Sunday, uh, the Sunday at the beginning of Passion Week. And so um, we might wonder if there are any new things that could be said about it. What, uh, what could we learn? But sometimes looking at it from a different perspective, we don't often come at it from John's perspective. I love using Matthew because in Matthew, after Jesus does the parade and does the cleansing of the temple, we discover that the blind and the lame go to Jesus at the temple. And Matthew says, you could hear the children singing in the background. And I, I love the picture of that, of after Jesus um, does whatever it is he's doing in cleansing the temple, and we know that he was in the marketplace of the temple. And if we understand things correctly, it was in the court of the Gentiles. You may, you may remember from your Old Testament studies that when the, the temple was together, the, the Jewish folks had their worship, and then they had the court of the women that was separate from the main worship part. And then there was another section called the court of the Gentiles. And it was in this court, the court of the Gentiles, that Jesus did his, uh, uh, the court of the Gen, uh, in the court of the Gentiles, where the money changers had set up their tables for commerce, for the trading, for the sacrifices, and doing their business. And uh, so that might, that might say something to us about Jesus' understanding of that temple area. Because in the accounts of the cleansing, Jesus references the Old Testament texts that declare that this was to be a house of prayer and it was to be a house of prayer for all nations and the Gentile court. So that's kind of the, the backdrop of, of what we see here and yet John doesn't put all that into his account here in chapter 12. Or does he? He has another way of approaching that understanding. I want to explore that with us this morning just a little bit. Palm Sunday is a disappointment to a lot of expectations. The people want a hero. That can be easily seen by the crowd of people that join the parade, waving palm branches, preparing the way for something that they expect, something that they can collect from the images of their past the tradition, the teaching of the scriptures that they're familiar with, an expectation of a deliverer. The poor are suffering under the foot of the Romans. Even the well-off people 
Even the high-class Jewish people, even the religious community that has been given the opportunity, the right to restore the worship rituals at the temple, even this group of people are constrained, they're restricted, they have limitations. There's no room to be the full flourishing people of God and they're feeling it keenly. The chosen people are feeling the boots of the Roman soldiers every day. They are sure that a change is needed. Now, I want to suggest to you that times haven't changed all that much. We today know that it's not just kings and dictators like a Roman emperor that take advantage of their people. We read the history accounts and we know, and even into our own day, you can spin a, uh, spin a globe and pick a country that has a dictator and you can see how they grind the people down in our own time. But we also know that even in democracies around the world, elections can be rigged and opposition can be eliminated. We know that election cycles can be influenced. Our government has done it. We've been subject to it. We know that governments systemize their tax systems to take advantage of their citizens, keeping safe the advantages, whether it's the unconscionable political leaders' salaries or their health benefits or their retirement plans. We know that financial institutions may be too big or considered too big to fail. And yet, they have to be bailed out by the very people that they've taken advantage of. We know that if a company should fail, don't worry, the CEO will have a golden parachute. We can identify in a little way, I think, with the original people of Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is a story of disappointment. It's a story of unfulfilled expectations. Someone who is admired lets us down. Now, it's easy to be critical, and I've pointed a finger out there at the political systems of our world, the ruling powers of our world. As a religious community, we need to look at ourselves as well. We need to think of our power structures, and we need to think of our places of influence, our prophetic role to the political world of our times, will lose its power, our prophetic voice to the political world of our time will lose its authority, our prophetic influence will lose its authenticity if we haven't examined ourselves and live up to our values. And so, our critique needs to be careful. We need to live out that which is true to us. We need to understand that when we speak, our lives must reflect the values that we speak. Or uh, make sure the words we speak don't deny the values that we speak, that we share that we say are foundational to who we are. Now, the crowds who sang the psalm, Hallelujahs, as Jesus entered Jerusalem, they were proclaiming that Jesus was the one who identified as the ancestor of King David. He was to be the fulfillment, the psalmist said, of God's activity in the world in restoring the kingdom. Jesus is the king. And Jesus represents an alternative view, though, to what the expectations were. 
He reveals an alternative purpose of the work of the Messiah. It's pro- as these folks understood proclaimed in the scriptures. An understanding different in this time. The people had understood that deliverance was to be on the way. And their expectation was a deliverance from the authority, the Roman authority, that was pressing down on them. And yet, Jesus didn't deal with the Roman authorities according to that expectation. Jesus was about something else. It's interesting to me, this text, as I said, doesn't deal with the cleansing of the temple. And that seems to be critical to what Jesus is about. And how will John explain that to us? If we read the second part of the text that our scripture reading this morning says, in verse 16 it says, his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. Interesting, John uses the word when Jesus was glorified. He doesn't say when Jesus was killed, but says when he was glorified. The disciples remembered. When Jesus was crucified, the disciples were heartbroken. They had to look beyond that. And when Jesus was resurrected, they slowly began to see beyond that. Jesus, was, Jesus used this word in verses that are following that we looked at last Sunday, uh, further here in John's Gospel. Not read this morning, but we looked at it last week, where we have this little story where some Greeks, Gentile folks, were in the multitude who come up to Philip and ask him, take us to Jesus. We want to see Jesus. And Philip goes to Andrew, and Andrew and Philip then make a discernment, and they go to Jesus on behalf of the Gentiles. And Jesus' response to them is this interesting word where he says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Something is happening, and John identifies it here in this moment here. It was something that had been growing. Uh, We could look at a variety of scriptures um, that would give this to us uh, in John's account. If you go back to John chapter uh, 2, Jesus had said to his mother, you maybe remember at the at the wedding at Cana, his mother went to him and says, we're out of wine. And what does Jesus say to his mother? He says, well, my time has not yet come. This is the first time that John uses that phrase. Jesus says, my time has not yet come. Uh, Moving on to chapter 7, Jesus is talking to his brothers who are skeptical about the things that he's doing, skeptical about the claims that people are making about him. And Jesus says to them, Well, my time hasn't come yet. My time hasn't come yet. And later in that conversation, they go up to a celebration and Jesus said, well, my time hasn't yet fully come. And then later in chapter 7, the authorities are engaged with Jesus. They're trying to trick him. They're bringing questions to him. And on this occasion, they bring to him a woman Uh, Actually, that's chapter 8. In chapter 7, the authorities have actually tried to arrest him. But the text tells us in verse 30 that no one laid hands on him because his hour had not yet come. And that attempt by the authorities continues. They question, they bring concerns, they bring this woman taken in adultery. And Jesus goes on to talk to them about the fact that he is the light of the world. And it says that they didn't arrest him. No one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. Now, 
Here in chapter 12, Jesus says, the hour has come. And it comes in response to the request for Gentiles to see Jesus. Jesus is pointing out that he has been at work and he's lifting the cover or he's cleaning out the court of the Gentiles so that the Gentiles can come into worship. His hour is coming. Jesus is going to be glorified when he opens up the heavens for all of God's creation. So John is getting at this in a powerful way. His time has come to be glorified. John has been leading us along that trail throughout his account in this text. Jesus, King Jesus, the one who rode the donkey, the Messiah, he's going to open the gates of heaven, open the doors to all who come to him. It's interesting that while all of this has been going on, we know in those moments his time has not yet come, that the cycle of things here that is happening is the opposition is growing to him, uh, against him. Verse 17, so the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. So the people that had come here, they had uh, to celebrate on uh, this Palm Sunday, this uh, parade up the street of Jerusalem. Uh, John is saying that they had been witnesses uh, to the resurrection of Lazarus and we could, uh, we could go back to uh, that account, which is just chapter 11. We just finished that story. And the identification is, the Pharisees then said to one another, look at all these people. You see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. They're feeling like... There's nothing they can do. They wanted to arrest him. They wanted to use him. But the people are adoring him. They'll rise up against us if we do anything. And so just before our scripture reading here today, we have this text in verse 9. When the great crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, They came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest planned to put Lazarus to death as well. Interesting. They were going to not only try to put Jesus to death, they wanted to put this man who had been resurrected back in the grave. The Opposition against Jesus just multiplies. You see this confusion on the part of the people of what was going on. Jesus, in um, uh, the the, uh, earlier part of John's gospel, uh, in chapter 5, you may remember the story where Jesus uh, heals the lame man, man who'd been lame for 38 years. People were angry. The scribes and Pharisees were angry because... Jesus had told the man to pick up his mat and walk. And he carried his mat and it was on the Sabbath day. It broke the traditional rules. Chapter 9, Jesus restored the sight of a blind man. The same thing happens. It happens on the Sabbath. And as the story continues, you know that long story, the man ends up being excommunicated from the synagogue because the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders, the teachers are upset that it happened on the Sabbath day. And then in chapter 11, Jesus raises Lazarus. And the intensity is building against Jesus in such a way that not only are they going to kill Jesus, they're going to try to get rid of all the evidence of his work. They're going to kill Lazarus as well. They were indifferent to the miracles. This is a picture of what uh, traditional religion can do. It had killed the capacity for compassion and caring. They were concerned because their traditions were violated. And so the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death as well. 
They could put two people to that instead of just one. Interesting. It was their own high priest, Caiaphas, who said, it's expedient that one person should die. But you know, sin has a way, has a tendency to grow like that. And that was only the beginning. Hostility to God continues to be revealed down through the ages. It wasn't enough. We don't have an account that they actually killed Lazarus. They did crucify Jesus. They will get rid of him. At least they think they've got rid of him. Pilate probably thought he had done his business with Jesus. The Roman world and the Jews, the leaders of the synagogues and at the temple thought they had dealt with Jesus by his crucifixion. They're done with it. We don't know what happened to Lazarus. But within a couple of generations, the blood of thousands of little Christs had been shed across the empire. The hostility was pervasive, unending, and a long succession of martyrs followed. It is expedient that one should die. Lazarus as well, but it never ends. We could follow the trail. The blood of the martyrs, as one theologian Tertullian has said, is the seed of the church. Fox's Book of Martyrs records early martyrs of the faith. We could look at the Martyr's Mirror, which does some of the early, but also 16th century martyrs from our own faith tradition. Or we could talk about a more up-to-date of that uh, martyr tradition in the book, By Their Blood. We could trace the influences of communism through the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, Romania. We could talk about the thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who have been martyred because of political differences. Red China, North Korea, across Africa, Ethiopia as being representative of that. I remember uh, as a boy in uh, vacation, uh, Good News Bible Club, we had one in our town, and we would go on Tuesday nights, Good News Bible Club, and, and I remember the Victor and Viola Dorsch, who has served in East Africa, and around that time, back in 1962, a Mennonite missionary, the stories recorded in A Whisper in a Dry Land by Omar E.B., it's the story of Merlin Grove who gave his life as a martyr. And the tradition continues. And into our own time, we can trace and follow those stories. We can follow the stories through the voices of the martyrs, organizations like Open Doors. It's expedient that one should die. Hmm. And Lazarus as well. And it never ends goes on and on. The calling of the faithful. So the chief priests made their plans. But the Messiah, who paraded, paraded into Jerusalem, has another way, giving himself for humankind. And he calls his people. He calls his people to follow in his way. What does our reading of scripture lead us to believe? How might we encounter this Messiah challenging our expectations? It may not be the political deliverance that we were seeking. It may not be the financial fortune that we were looking for. It may not be the fullness of blessing that we have read about. It may be as Jeremiah talked about it. A new relationship of intimacy. Knowing that one is loved and cared for by the Messiah. God's full representative. God revealed in the flesh. Show us this new way of living, God. Help us to love like you love. We, we've been reminded in this series leading up to Passion Week about how big God's love is, God's promises for you and for me, 
and for all of his created world, Gentiles, even as we talked about the covenant with Noah, even the animal kingdom. We've been reminded about how long, how long God's love is, lasting from generation to generation to our children and our children's children and our children's children's children. We've noticed that there may be many things that come between us. Conflicts and problems and disagreements of many kinds. And maybe today on Palm Sunday we're invited to take whatever that is, whatever our expectations are, and lay them down like a palm branch. And look up to Jesus as we have been called to again and again through this covenant series. As the people of the past have been surprised by Jesus, what he said and what he did, maybe Jesus will surprise us too. He invites us to join his parade. And he wants to write it on our hearts. Let's pray. God, you've reminded us again today that you are the God of the ages. Your way is not always popular, doesn't always appear to be victorious, but it shows forth the light of your great compassion for all your creation. May we look to your son, the light of the world, engraving his love on our hearts today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. For our hymn of response, turn to number 69. The Lord is king and please stand. benediction today I'm asking you to participate I will say a line and then you will affirm it after me if you will we are people of God we go in God's love to extend God's love and live God's promise Thank mm -hmm. you.